absolutely delighted to be here and I especially want to thank uh, uh, to Mark Catriel and Ati for making it possible. If not for my very, very dear and very old, I don't mean chronologically old, uh, I'm the oldest of them all, but in any event, uh, my very, very, very dear and old colleagues here at Haifa University, uh, I want to thank them uh, really for well, uh, for putting, my, putting me forward for the honorary doctorate. I, it, it came as a total surprise. I was absolutely delighted, and I was delighted that it was being awarded by Haifa University, specifically. Um, a place that I think of when I think of my colleagues as pioneering, as pioneering, as bringing performance studies to Haifa University, as really pushing the envelope of what communication studies means. And so uh, it's, a, it's a really great honor and a great pleasure to be here. Also, I have to say that I arrived at NYU, as, uh, as Ati explained, um, at the same time that he was there, which was 1980-81, and he wrote a marvelous dissertation on Zionist pageants. And I was asked to convey to you from a colleague who knew I was going to be seeing you, Neely Amit. She said, tell Ati I love his work on Zionist pageants. And that goes back a long way, and of course he's done much more uh, since then. So Ati had suggested that I talk to you about, well, performance studies, of course, but a personal journey. So it's going to be quite personal, and um, it will flesh out a little bit of the narrative that, that Ati presented to you in the introduction. So let, let me, because I think, uh, in a way, it's a combination of a personal formation and a professional track. It's somehow how the personal and the professional come together. So uh, let, let me start from what I would think of as the very, 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 very beginning, which is that I was born in 1942. So I was born during the war, but I was born in Toronto. And my parents had been born and raised in Poland, and they came to Canada in the 1930s. Um, and of course, we lost our families um, in the Holocaust, but they came from Poland. My father came from south central Poland, from a town called Opatów, or Opt in Yiddish. And my mother came from a city called brest or Brisk in Yiddish, which uh, is on the border with Belarus. Before the war, it was in Poland, and now it's in, in uh, Belarus. So I grew up in, um, I, it's, it was like the Lower East Side in the 20s, but it was Canada, it was Toronto. So it was, um, it was a, I, you know, to call it an immigrant neighborhood isn't quite right because it was post-Holocaust. I, I don't think of post-Holocaust as, as immigration. And the many of survivors that arrived in the late 40s, early 50s, they weren't survivors yet. They were, they were still DPs. They were displaced persons, which was not a term of honor. Actually, it, was, it had a kind of a negative connotation to it. Um, and so there was recent immigration from just before the war, from the 20s and 30s. There was this post-war, post-Holocaust immigration, and I lived downtown in this very intense immigrant neighborhood. Yiddish was spoken on the street. There was the Farban Shula across the road in the corner, and then there was the Parrot Shula, and I ended up at the Talmud Torah, and across the road was the Moshe Zakanim, the old age home, and, it was, and the Volksverein for receiving these new immigrants. So this was the starting point that I think, I, I, I think in a way I always felt not just, if you will, Jewish, not just Canadian, but I also felt very European, that I felt surrounded by this uh, very, very close connection to Europe. Now, um, in, you know, when I uh, embarked on my university career, I wanted to study anthropology, but at the University of Toronto, which I thought was the greatest university in the world, I couldn't imagine going anywhere else, um, I, I, I wasn't crazy about the department, so I thought, you know, I'll just study something that won't do me any harm. I'll be educated. I'll study English literature. I won't have the problem of having to study in French or in some other language. And it won't, you know, at least I'll, I'll read, I'll, I'll become I'll, I'll, cultured. That, that, that the very, I'll learn how to write. Uh, so I did that, and um, I, got, I married very young. I mean, I don't know what young means here, but I was... I think I was just about 20 or so. So that's young, right? That's very young. And, um, and that was after spending a year in Israel. So I, maybe that prepared me for this very young marriage. I'm not sure. But in any event, so, um, and my husband uh, at the time was a potter, was a ceramist, a wonderful ceramist, decided he wanted to be a painter. And 
that the place to study was in San Francisco. So I um, went to my university professors at Toronto and I said, I've applied to the University of California, Berkeley, and I want to know, is, is it going to be a big letdown from the University of Toronto? <laughs> so they said, no, no, no. He said, it'll be okay. You, you don't have to worry. So it was there that um, I, I arrived in my senior year and I had more uh, course credit in English literature than I needed for their masters because it was a Canadian system, like a British system. You study literature, English literature, you do it from top to bottom, that's all you do. It's a whole year of Anglo-Saxon language, a whole year of Anglo-Saxon literature. There is nothing more boring in this entire universe and a whole year of it, yeah, not, not just a, a semester or a quarter. And when I got to Berkeley, they said, you know, you have no breadth requirements. So I opened up the catalog and it was like a child in a candy shop. It was everything. And that was where finally I really found what I wanted to do. I, I was able to, to study folklore, anthropology, ethnography, ethnomusicology, uh, textiles, two courses in the history of textiles. It was, it was just bliss. And it was from there that I, I moved into what I would call interdisciplinary social science. And it, it was a perfect fit for me because I had always, without realizing that you could pursue this professionally, had always been interested in, in what I think of the, uh, the exceptional quality of ordinary people. That's how I'd put it, that ordinary people have, uh, that is, if one has the tools and if one has, if one is, um, uh, I would say if one has the tools, one, one can discover what is exceptional and very special about so-called ordinary people, not the famous ones, not the ones that have a big education and come from distinguished families. So that was always something very appealing to me. And I found that through ethnography, through folklore, through ethnomusicology, through those fields, that I could explore the, the creativity, the kind of cultural creativity of ordinary people. And that really was my, uh, became my passion. The best place to study that was at Indiana University in Bloomington. And when I told my colleagues at Berkeley, and I was at Berkeley between 64, 65 and 67, and if you know anything about the 60s in the United States, especially in California, you know it's the free speech movement, and it's the women's movement, and the civil rights movement, and the anti-war movement, and it was hippies, it was everything, and it was culture shock for a nice Jewish girl from an immigrant neighborhood in Toronto. It was pure, complete, and 100% culture shock. And so um, I said to them, well, I'm, we're gonna move to Bloomington, Indiana. And they said, are you crazy? How could you go from the Bay Area, from San Francisco, you know, from the Haifa of America? How could you, how could you go to, uh, how, how could you go to Bloomington, Indiana in the middle of nowhere, the Midwest? But it turned out to be absolutely fantastic for me. And the, the period I was there, 67 to 70, was a very, very important period in, um, I would say, kind of a paradigm shift in the study of culture, folklore, language, and it was a shift towards performance. Uh, and it was a shift towards sociolinguistics and the idea of a communication as a practice and not something that you would simply study um, like structural linguistics, semiotics, uh, a more sort of, I would say, textual approach, but rather it was an approach that was looking at, um, in, in my case, let me put it this way, that when I began studying folklore specifically, um, it was a matter of studying, if you will, texts in context with tale types and annotations and the historic geographic method, which frankly I actually found fascinating. I know it sounds really dry, historic geographic method. It's really, but, but actually it was very, very interesting. But the big paradigm shift came when this idea of studying a text, that is extracting a text from a performance in fact, and then putting it into something called context, which were the circumstances in which it had been, quote, collected, as opposed to performed, that there was a real paradigm shift that said that performance is the, is the object. That is the object. And that performance meant not just the words that were spoken and not even the tale that was extracted from it and the tale type that was extracted from that, but in fact, the total event. And the total event could be quite large. And so that was my starting point. And my interest was specifically in, line, in speech, in, if you will, the, the, the art of talking. So conversation, storytelling, uh, uh, speech metaphor, speech play, um, I would say, um, good talkers, 
just people who know how to talk. And I have to tell you, it's the best performance of all. When you're in the presence of good talkers, ordinary good talkers, it's the best. And um, so that was my starting point. And what, uh, uh, there was a kind of a pivotal moment in the first semester in my graduate work, I was studying with uh, Joel Mintz, A Course in Field Methods. And he had done his dissertation on legends of the Hasidim in Brooklyn. And uh, somehow rather, we had to do a fieldwork project of some kind. And he, um, he discovered that I knew Yiddish. He said, so why don't you do something you know, on, on Yiddish? So, and at the same time, I was taking a course in Russian folklore, and at the time, the only textbook was a Soviet-era textbook called Russian Folklore. And I remember going home with this textbook on Russian folklore to my family at Thanksgiving, and sitting at the kitchen table on a Sunday morning, my father's reading the paper, my mother's washing the dishes. I open up the, the textbook because I had to read for some kind of a class or whatever, and I have the section on, on death. And it says in here, it says, it says that when the person dies, you should lay out the body with the head facing the door and the feet inside so that they, they won't find their way back in. The corpse won't find its way back in. And you should put a glass of water and a hanky, a little uh, um, towel, by the window, open the window so that the soul can go out and wash itself and dry itself as it exits through the window. And, and my father says, well, yeah, we did that. I said, what? And I discovered that right in my own family, there was this absolute gold mine, and then I started to explore, well, what else do they know, and what else does, do my grandparents, and then their friends, and then the wider Jewish community of, of, of Toronto. So I, uh, I decided I'll do a fieldwork project for the course based on that, and I called a colleague of mine uh, who had been the director of a summer camp that I went to many, many years. It was Camp Kfutsa. It was a Habonim summer camp. And it turned out he was a Yiddish linguist finishing his doctoral dissertation on the Yiddish dialects of northeastern Poland. That also sounds very fascinating, which actually it was. Actually it was. It, it, in that dissertation, you would find out why in some parts of Poland, Jews considered mushrooms treif, tomatoes treif, where they made farfel by uh, grating it, where they chopped it up, where they rolled it out and cut it up. And, and you may not think that's important. Actually, it's very important because it's a way of marking Jewish ethnographic and linguistic regions. And in, in any case, that is a diversion. So, so when I called him in New York and I said to him, uh, guess what? Um, the, the Canadian Museum of Civilization is doing surveys of immigrant groups in Canada, um, and they're interested in what cultural practices they brought with them from the old country, what are they retaining in Canada, and what are they innovating? And I, I said to him, and you know, I wrote to them and said, would you like a survey on, on Yiddish, on Yiddish culture and Yiddish cultural practices? They said, oh, yes. So they sent me a, a you hair um, a tape recorder in an enormous wooden box and how to carry this if you're doing field work to carry this enormous chunk of, of technology but nonetheless he said oh he said I'm sending you a an air ticket and in two weeks I want you to come to New York so I did and why because in New York is the Yivo Institute for Jewish Research the Yivo Institute for Jewish Research was established in 1925 in Vilna and in 1939, when the war broke out, the, the YIVO uh, shifted its headquarters from Vilna to New York City. And they were, if you will, the university of, they were the Jewish university in Eastern Europe before there, there, before there was any way in any university in that part of the world where you could study anything, anything remotely connected to the culture that Jews had created in the place where they had lived for a thousand years. And so that was really, um, I would say that was a transformative experience. And it was um, my first really big, big project that is a kind of connection between my personal history, my professional training, and what I would ultimately do in the last 10 years here, uh, that is to say in Warsaw, with the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And so YIVO was, at the time, there were still people working there who had worked in the original YIVO in Vilna, and that was amazing. And I had a chance to meet Max Weinreich, who was one of the founders of YIVO, just shortly before he died. And I was taken, they, they, they had their headquarters in the Vanderbilt Mansion on 86th Street and 5th Avenue, just a couple of blocks from the Metropolitan Museum. So, and it was, 
you had the feeling when you walked into this incredible Vanderbilt mansion, which was once, you know, a ballroom with mirrors and whatnot, but you had the feeling that the Red Cross had just evacuated and that it was like the war just ended because it was so kind of run down and the little cubbies and they had, you know, put offices here and offices there and there was an office in the attic. But the, the brilliant sort of the wonderful experience that I had was that in March 1968 in Poland, there was an anti-Zionist, anti, it's after the Six Day War, an anti-Zionist, anti, essentially anti-Semitic campaign, and it was the last major wave of Jewish emigration from Poland. And those who left were the ones who had stayed and didn't want to leave. They, they never thought of leaving, but they were forced to, and it was absolutely traumatic for them. And one of the ones who left was a man by the name of Lucian Dobroszewski. He was a survivor of the Lodz ghetto, he was an historian who, after uh, the Holocaust, went to Warsaw, got a PhD at the University of Warsaw, and he was one of the ones who left, and he left without a word of English. And when he came to America, what was he going to do? Yivo hired him. And what did they hire him to do? They hired him to catalog 15,000 photographs in their collection of photographs of Jewish life in Poland between 1864, which was the earliest photograph, and 1939, which was, the, well, was where we basically ended the, the story. And they said they wanted me to work with him to um, create an exhibition of the original photographs and a book, which we did, and it was the basis then for a film. And it's called Image Before My Eyes, A Photographic History of Jewish Life in Poland, 1864 to 1939. Um, and it was a revolutionary project. It was revolutionary because it was, if you will, the not Vishniak project. It, it was the project that showed, um, if you will, uh, a, a history. Well, it was a history of Jewish photography, which was how we, uh, I insisted that we would write an introduction that was a history of photography of Jews, not a history of Polish Jews as seen through photography. But at the same time, it also offered a kind of visual history, but a visual history that was completely the opposite of the stereotype of the shtetl. And that had been the image that had been very much, very strong, Fiddler on the Roof, Vishniak, the great photographer, Roman Vishniak, and, and others. Now, so that experience was really extraordinary because I went through 15,000 black and white photographs more than once, called the collection, called, called the selection down with Lucien to about 500, went through that many times, and I then felt like I had a data, I had like, how can I say, I had a bank of black and white images. All of a sudden, this enormous sort of visual archive in my, in my head that I'd never ever had before. And also an understanding that came from working with him. He was a wonderful historian and a wonderful, wonderful man. That, um, so that project, and, and that emanated in a major exhibition of the original photographs at the Jewish Museum in, in New York. And it was a, a really a landmark exhibition. It's really, it, it really seemed to turn the uh, it really sort of turned the perception of the of of what um, I would say Polish Jews, but East European Jews, most East European Jews more generally, were all about. So while that was happening, all all along, um, you know, I had started <coughs> interviewing my father and my mother and everybody else in 1967, and then after I finished my dissertation and I started teaching and I was working with Yivo and the photograph collection, you know, I continued interviewing my father. So at the time, he was busy working. He was a you know, relatively young man. He was doing me a favor. He wasn't particularly interested. But when he was about 59, he got sick. He had an operation, and he was worried that he might get sick again. My mother would be stuck with the business. So he retired early. And at the age of 60, he got better. And now he was a young man. He was better. And he was retired. And so I continued to interview him. And I knew from, and I'm going to, maybe we'll, I'll go to this now, just a second. So I, I knew, yeah, yeah, we'll take the lights down from here. If you know anything about the field of performance studies, you know that he is really the founding father of the field. I mean, together with his colleagues, but really and truly, I think of Richard Schechner as the father of the field. So I get a phone call from Richard, and he says, Barbara, yes. He says, how would you like to be the chairman of our department? I said, no, I'm really not interested. He said, well, how about lunch? I said, okay. So I met, um, so we went to Greenwich Village 
uh, to have really, uh, that doesn't exist anymore, I think El T uh, T uh, Torino or something, but you know, go down a few steps, it's dark green inside, it's sconces on the walls, it's old waiters, and very, you know, really old, like really old time village, uh, Greenwich Village. And I'm sitting with Richard and with uh, Brooks McNamara and Michael Kirby and Ted Hoffman. And I see, first of all, I see these guys get along with each other. I think, oh, that's, that's a good sign. And they start, start to talk to me about the field. And I'd already been following a little bit what they had been doing. They'd been running these performance studies um, sort of seminars that were together with Irving Goffman, with Barbara Meyerhoff, with, uh, uh, I think, um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember, it says several other like really big, big people. And I thought, you know, this is all very interesting, but I'm not, A, I, I, I'm happy at Penn. I'm not interested in sharing an apartment. But as the conversation went along, I started, to, I started to be intrigued, and I eventually said yes. But then I thought to myself, you know what? They made a terrible mistake. They didn't know who they were really hiring. It will take them about two years to figure out, and it will be too late. <laughs> this, I, this I was absolutely convinced. I was totally convinced. So, and the, and the test, the litmus test was, when I started to teach, come on in, Linda, come on in, come on in, Karen, come on in. So the litmus test was, what am I going to teach? So the first course I wanted to teach was a course that was called The Aesthetics of Everyday Life. And that's me. That is 100% who I am, the aesthetics of everyday life. And I thought to myself, this is going to be the moment of truth. Nobody will enroll, and then they'll realize the terrible mistake they made. So sure enough, the class was full to overflowing. And who was in the class? directors, choreographers, dancers, and I thought, why? Why, why, uh, why wouldn't they take a, a course in the history of directing or in scene design or, you know, it's like a theater course. And they said, because we've had theater up to here. And also, it had to do with the kind of art they were making, and this is the key, that the faculty at NYU in the Department of Performance Studies, they were making performance that was completely different from what they were teaching. They were teaching in something called a graduate department of drama, and they were teaching like from, uh, you know, from uh, Antigone to Ibsen, drama, but they were actually making avant-garde experimental theater on off-off Broadway. So there was no relationship, no connection between what they were doing and also, uh, uh, Richard was busy in India studying Ram Leela, and he was running around the world with Kabuki and with uh, all kinds of non-Western, and, 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 and Brooks McNamara, he was busy with circus and American popular entertainment, and it was completely schizophrenic that their research interests and their artistic work had nothing to do with the history of drama, with plays taught as drama. So, um, so basically, these four guys they kind of let everything go because they were so busy off off Broadway. And the dean said to them, listen, get your act together. I'm going to close you down. So they said, OK, we have to, you know, we have to get it together. So they, they hired me. I said, well, why did you hire me, of all people? I'm, I'm not coming. I mean, I, I, I'm involved in theater. I like theater. I did theater in high school. But I mean, that's not a credential. I said, why, why me? And so they said, because you don't do theater. And then I realized that. What I do do is performance. I do performance, but I don't, but, but my focus is not performance on the stage. It's not performance in the sense of theater is performance, dance is performance. It's performance in a much broader sense. And it's the kind of, I would say, non matrixed, non stage performance that actually was more inspirational for these postmodern dancers and choreographers and much more inspirational for these experimental theater people than anything they would get from a conventional theater course. And so there they were in my aesthetics of everyday life to my, I, I couldn't believe it. So, and I was taking them all over the city. I mean, we were, we, this was the period of like break dancing and stations of the cross processions on the Lower East Side and the Purim Spiel and the Bavar Hasidim. Can you imagine taking a bunch of these very hip NYU postmodern dancers and theater people to Bobov and having them, you know, in the women in the women's section, the men in the men's section, you know, uh, uh, when we're documenting the Purim Spiel. So it was really uh, an incredible experience. And, um, and I would say that in the time, and I was with the uh, Department of Performance Studies from 19, the academic year, 8081, until really two years ago. And the, 
department, I, I, I think it, it's the most important department in the field. Of course, it's a small field, but, but nonetheless, it really, was, it, it really is pioneering as a field, absolutely, totally pioneering, and pioneering in a way that I think is really a perfect, would be, is, is a kind of a perfect model for here, for Haifa, and I think it's wonderful that Ati is here and is able to bring this perspective here, and why? First of all, it basically, um, it's interdisciplinary, radically, radically interdisciplinary. It's also, it, from an intellectual, academic point of view, it's also radically interdisciplinary from an arts point of view. So that means that there's no artistic practice that cannot be understood or studied within a performance studies frame. And lastly, it's intercultural in the sense that it isn't simply European high culture. It's everything. It's, it's um, from every strata, from, from if you will, folk popular um, and so-called high culture, which are not distinctions that we like, but also culturally looking at India, China, um, in various European traditions, etc. So that was really very, very, very formative. <coughs> and while, um, I mean, in, in my um, non-theatrical aesthetics of everyday life way, my, my work in performance studies went in two, well, several directions. One direction I taught a course called Food and Performance, which actually was incredible, I have to say, it was one of my favorite courses. And the other was a seminar called Museum Theater, Museums as Performance. And I'll say a word in a moment of how I think about museums as theater and museums as performance and how that shaped the work that I eventually did and have been doing in Poland. So now, to, that, that was the NYU thread, the performance studies thread. Now back to the, the thread that starts with the project with my father. So 1967, the interviews start. And it took about 10 years after he retired for him to relent and to finally agree to paint what he could remember because he had said, he said, I can't, I don't know how, uh, I never did it before, I have no training, and he just relented. But every Father's Day, every anniversary, every birthday, we would bring him paint, easel, paper, canvas, Conti crayon, pastels, whatever, and he kept on saying no. And anyway, one day my mother came home and she said, I've just been to the Jewish Community Center and I signed you up for classes and they don't give refunds. So he, so, so he, you know, he had no choice. So he starts in life drawing. After two sessions, he gives up. He says, listen, the model is nude, that's okay. But he said, the teacher said she should move all the time and we should sketch quickly. He says, I can't do it, finished. Then he went to the still life class. He calls it his green pepper period because they had green peppers and onions and he was supposed to make like still life. And I could see that the teacher was trying to show him how to draw. And I saw a sketch at the bottom of the page. And it was like you go to the art store and there's like a booklet that says how to draw in 10 easy lessons. And it was one of those kind of, this is hopeless. Anyway, we browbeat him un until the only way he could stop us was to start. And he did. And on his 50th wedding anniversary, uh, my sister and I uh, actually um, made a beautiful 50th wedding anniversary for my mother and father. And we did it in her home and we catered everything ourselves. We cooked everything ourselves. And my father arrives with the easel and his first painting. And he was so shocked. He was so unbelievably shocked at what he had done. He couldn't believe he had done it, that once he, once he had done that, he was on a roll. So I, I, I want to show you a little bit about what he did because this now really goes to what Ati was saying earlier about memory. So of course, memory is a very, very big part of the work that I've done. But I would say it's only part of it. It's only part of it. And um, so, the, so, so I'm very, um, uh, in the case of working with my father, in the beginning it was all uh, spoken word. But once he started painting, it became a, a, a mode of narration that was both visual and spoken, and the, the, the words were not captions to the image, and the images were not illustrations of the story. But rather, it was, they were, uh, they were working together because there were, uh, and then once I had the paintings, I started to get, I started to have him narrate from the paintings, to start from the paintings and narrate out. So it was an extremely interesting project to look at visual memory, that is literally visual memory, that was being expressed in spoken word and also being expressed visually. And so that, that became a very, very, in, very interesting from a, I would say, theoretical and analytical point of view. So in this, this is a really, really great example, because in any one painting, there may be 10 narratives, 10 stories. And 
there's a way that he remembers that is very characteristic to take this one painting. So he basically, for example, because he, you know, I call him um, extrospective, not, not introspective. Now, what does that mean? Um, I remember we got an award for the book and I said to him, listen, we're going to have to get up there and you're going to have to say something about what this award means to you. He says, yeah. I say, I said, he says, like what? I said, well, why don't you tell them how you feel? He says, how I feel? You know, like, I mean, he, he doesn't think that way. He doesn't talk that way. So I said, well, then, you know, so that you have to ask him something concrete. So he basically, the way he remembers is the way in which it, it, it's out of the curiosity he has for the world around him and for how things work. And in essence, his town became for him a memory palace. If he could visualize the town, he could remember by literally going door to door to door to door to door. And in this case, the way he narrates this is he says, okay, look, he said, the hat. He says, you know, that was the, the Polish schoolboy's hat, but the religious Jewish, boy, Jewish boys wouldn't wear that hat. Do you know why? I said, why? He said, because it had a seam at the top that formed a cross. Okay. He says, you see that collar? That's a Slonimsky collar. Slonimsky was a great Polish romantic poet from the 19th century. It was very fashionable to wear a Slonimsky collar. Then he has the blue blazer. Then he has the plus fours, these, these very fashionable, you know, puffy uh, uh, plus fours. He says, you know, he says, when all of us had the plus fours and we would stand in a row, he said, it looked like one big skirt. Then he says the white socks. He says, you know, my father was already in Canada and he sent me the white socks. He says, there were two pairs, one up to the knee and the other one rolled down. But the most thing he was most proud of were the red ski boots with the brass eyelets and the yellow shoelaces. Then there's a whole story about the herring. So what's the story with the herring? He said, well, you see the herring, he says? You'll notice that there's a little piece of newspaper. It's just a little handhold for the herring. He said, newspaper was so precious, you wouldn't wrap the whole herring up in a newspaper. You would tear off a little piece, and you would put it like this, and you would carry it. And you see, he says, that the salt, the brine from the herring is dripping. He says, um, and I would lick the brine from the herring. But he says, you know from that, now we're keeping on going. You know from that herring, he says, we'd make a katzborscht. What's a katzborscht? It means it's a scratch borscht. Why is it a scratch borscht? He says, because you would take the herring, and the best was a male herring. You would open up the herring. You would take out the milts. You take out the sperm sac. You would open up the sperm sac. You would scrape out the sperm. You would take the sperm, and you would mix it with a little bit of sugar, a little bit of vinegar, a little bit of water. That's the sauce. Then you would cut up the herring, and you would cut up the bread, and you would take a little bit of garlic on the bread, and then the whole family would sit around, and you would take a piece of bread, and you would dip it in the sauce, and you would take a piece of herring, and that was a meal. So now we could keep going. I mean, it's not, this is one painting, one painting. And, but, okay, so it says here, here you can see me wearing the unofficial school uniform, you bet. And let me tell you about the herring. Okay. So how did I know, I mean, I knew already from childhood, he was, um, he had apprenticed to a shoemaker in Poland, he apprenticed to an electrician, he had worked in a sweatshop in Canada, and he eventually was a house painter, and then eventually he had his own paint and wallpaper store. So he was always dealing with paint, with color, with wallpaper, with floor covering, but I, you know, he, he once decorated the bedroom for me and my sister, and it was incredible. It was a deep, deep blue with these brilliant yellow curtains. And he made the bedspreads with a yellow skirt with a circus quilted top. I mean, I, I just knew that he had it. So whenever I would interview him and I didn't understand something, like for example, he wanted to explain to me if there was a fire, how they pumped water. And it's like a whole machine and they have to go down to the river and they have to fill the pump up and they have to wheel it up. And he made me a whole painting. But I said, how does the pump work? So he would show me, he would draw it. Or he would say, you know, it was cheaper to stencil the walls than to paint, than to put, with, the wallpaper was expensive. You could afford a piece of wallpaper like this behind a, a, a grandfather clock. But if you wanted to decorate your home, basically it was cheaper to hire a guy with stencils to stencil the walls. I said, well, how do they do it? He said, well, we had these hunting scenes. And he, then he made me the drawings of what they made the stencils and even the little brush that was used, a special brush for stenciling. Of course, he was a house painter. He knew these things. Or he said, you know, I know how to make a shoe. And he, he gave me, and I have two pages of technical descriptions how to make a shoe. My sister said, this is, 
he, she said, the people, people's eyes will glaze over. You should leave all that out. I said, no way. So then my father said to me, you know, I went to the steam room at the JCC at the community center, and there's a survivor there, and he was a, a shoemaker in the old country. So I said to him, listen, I described to my daughter how to make a shoe. This is what I told her. And he goes into this whole long description, and the guy says to him, you know, Meyer, he says, from your description, I would know how to make a shoe. <laughs> so it, clearly, it, it, was, uh, it, it worked. So this is, his, this is his first painting. And, and here you can see, this is, this is the house painter in him. He's got the stenciled walls. He has this little border at the top. And the other thing he prided himself on is that he learned how to fake every wood grain imaginable. So all our doors and all our house, we had mahogany and walnut and teak and maple and oak and, and everything faked, totally faked. And his paintings, everything is wood grained. So you can see that the, uh, over there, uh, the, the table, for example. But there are other ones where it's kind of wood grain mania. It's every surface is wood grained. And, and these are skills that he knew from his house painting days that he actually deployed in the paintings. So as a curious boy, so when we were making the book and I would give him the, the draft of the typescript, and I would see he got very absorbed in reading it. And I said to him, you know, find mistakes, things that are missing, whatever. I could see. And I said to him, well, how does it read? And he'd say, it reads like a novel. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, you know, we're, we're, we're on the right track. So as we were doing it, I noticed, that, I noticed a discrepancy. What was the discrepancy? The discrepancy was that um, he went for seven years to public school. He should have finished at the age of 14, but he was 15 when he finished. I said, 15 when you finished? How did that happen? Oh, he said, I failed a year. I said, you failed a year? Because he was very insistent that we should do well in school and he's a very intelligent guy. Yeah, he said, I was playing hooky. I said, you played hooky for a year? He said, yeah. He says, how do you think, how do you think I know all about the blacksmith, the cooper, the rope maker, the prostitutes, the, the market, the, the fishmonger? He said, that's what I did for the year. The, the, the school was, the, 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 the town was his school. And he used to love to run around the whole town with a hoop. And it was a small enough, it was 10,000 people. And it was um, 6,500 Jews. And it was small enough that he could go everywhere. So after many years of interviewing him, I had a lot of places floating in my head. The corner of this and the corner of that and the end of this street and the beginning of that street. I had no idea where anything was. I said, make me a map. I made a list of all the places he told me. And I said, make me a map. And he did. And actually, it's not that far off. But what's really interesting is what, 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 what are the places that were meaningful to him, particularly as a child? which often were the places he could play, in the creek, under the bridge, in the pond, in the meadows, um, and, and also the places that were just interesting. So then, once he did the kitchen, he did the whole home. Then he went out to the courtyard, then he went off to the street. Then he started painting the, 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 the marketplace. Then he started painting, painting the town surrounds. And then he finally painted me the town panorama. Now what's so interesting is with these maps and panoramas, historically, North was at the bottom and south was at the top. And west was on the right and east was on the left. That's how they were oriented. So our way of making maps today is not how they made maps then. And, and this is very characteristic of historical panoramas, even from the medieval period, which is you take all the important buildings and you just flatten everything to make one big skyline, which is not necessarily the way that you would see it if you were able to stand on a mountain and look. So, and he narrates this beautifully from the old town gate to the city well, with the synagogue, with the monastery, the church, and, and everything else. Um, so, uh, of course, street life, a, a lot of life was lived out in the open, which I think made a huge difference for him because he was able to see, I mean, he could look in, in windows, he could see people working in courtyards, there were street performers, even a little town that was 10,000 people, which is really a small town, you had street performers like the organ grinder, or you had the human fly, you had this street performer who would climb up this, um, this building and he would put a pole out and he would dangle from it. And of course, my father is everywhere. He's like the Where's Waldo? I don't know if you know the American book that has like, a thousand people on one page and you're always looking to see Where's Waldo? Well, he's the Where's Waldo in, in, his, um, in his paintings. But um, for a kid, everyday life was much more interesting than any theater play. They did have theater. And the market day, of course, when, and these small towns often had enormous marketplaces because on market day, 
everybody would come in from the countryside. And of course, the little lady on the right is red because this is a very unvarnished, uncensored uh, perspective on the town. And by the time we were at this stage, he was old enough and so was I that no topic was off limits. Um, and, and he also had not only an eye or, a, in other words, the town was not only a kind of memory palace where if he could um, visualize the space, he could actually pull memory out of it. Or if he could visualize, for example, himself in his clothes, he could narrate it, he could remember it. Or if he could remember a process like making a shoe, if he started at the beginning, he could pull all this memory out of it. But also, he had an incredible eye for people and for town characters. So one of my favorites in, is um, his story of the richest man in town who had a car and a chauffeur, and all he ever did was periodically, the chauffeur would drive him around the town. That was it. <laughs> Just simply that he had a car and he had a chauffeur and drove him around the town. Now, he had a very nice wife. My, my father characterizes her as very intelligent, nice, lovely, beautifully dressed, but she had a problem. Problem was she was a kleptomaniac. And uh, I think this is apocryphal, but he claims it's true that she, even on Thursday, when fish came to the market, both for Jews would buy their fish on Thursday, so would the Christians, that she would even steal the fish and slip it down her bosom. <laughs> so, I mean, I can hardly believe it, but that's what he, that's what he claims. And her husband had a very, very uh, good solution. He said to all of the uh, shopkeepers in the town, he said, look, my wife, she's got a problem. She's a kleptomaniac. I know that. Just let her steal whatever she wants. You come to me on, on Monday and you tell me exactly what she stole, I'll pay you. And just leave her alone. I have to tell you, that's not a bad solution. It's better than going to jail. Not a bad, not a bad, uh, not a bad solution. So let me finish. Um, uh, so, you know, in a sense, I've sort of taken you on a kind of per very, very personal biographical track, um, a, a kind of academic track, a kind of professional one that takes me to performance studies in NYU. Um, the Evo track, which is more of a museum track, and to take it all the way forward to the present, um, let me take you to Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews, and to say this, that I would say that the three most meaningful projects that I've done have all of them been, that is, I've done plenty of things that I, I hope are theoretically interesting, academically interesting, but in fact, for me, the, the ones that have been most meaning, personally meaningful have been the ones that, that, have, that have been for a wide public. So that means the image before my eyes that I did with Lucien Dobroszczycki at the Evo. It means the project with my father. When we published the book in 2007, and we had the exhibition in 2007-2009, uh, pardon me, and we... Um, Made the, we, and we, we made a film and we went back to a Apatov to his town, I thought to myself, you know, God forbid I would die at that moment. I would feel that I had, uh, my life had been worthwhile, that I had been put on this earth for a reason. And then along comes the uh, Museum of the History of Polish Jews and the opportunity to lead the development of the permanent exhibition. And that, I thought, oh my goodness. I mean, who would have ever expected that after having done something that I found so profoundly meaningful, I would have this opportunity. So I want to say a few words about it. I want to encourage you to come tomorrow because we're going to be showing a film called Raise the Roof about how we created one component of this um, uh, museum, of this exhibition. And just I'll just say a very, few very, very quick words. And what I want to do is by, end by suggesting how performance studies informed the, the way that I approached this particular exhibition. So I think, uh, and I'll, 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 let, let me first just say this, that the Museum of the History of Polish Jews is located in Warsaw on the site of the Warsaw Ghetto, facing the monument to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. And this monument is sitting on the place where the uprising broke out on April 19th, 1943. And in 1948, on the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, there was the unveiling of this monument on the rubble of the ghetto because the ghetto, the Germans had destroyed the ghetto after they suppressed the uprising. The whole area was just uh, an ocean of rubble. And in, a year later, in 44, during the Warsaw Uprising, they destroyed 85% of the core of the city of Warsaw. So the city was completely destroyed. So until we opened this museum in, in 2014, really the only marker of Jewish presence and absence was this monument. And so the idea was to create um, a museum that would be in a respectful relationship to the monument, dramatic on the inside, 
with a permanent exhibition or core exhibition that would present a thousand year history of Polish Jews, which was a history that had been, if you will, understandably overshadowed by the Holocaust. And also, uh, it was our feeling that we had an obligation to remember not only how Polish Jews and European Jews died, but also how they lived. Now, when I think of muse museums as theaters, I think of them a very particular kind of theater. Call it still life theater, call it theater of mise-en-scene, call it scenographic theater, call it uh, storytelling in three-dimensional space, call it narrative space. There's all kinds of ways of thinking about this as theater without thinking of a proscenium stage and without thinking of um, a, a play as such. And there are several ways that we do it. I think this is a very, very good, uh, I think, example of what I would call a kind of a scenographic expression of the narrative. It's actually a, an attempt to um, launch the, the beginning of the partitioning of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So, of course, we show objects, but not only objects. And what's important to us is to, in a sense, um, bring the visitors into the theater of history so that they are themselves protects in, in a sense, protagonists in this history, and to do so in what we're calling narrative space. And we do this in a way that the narrative unfolds as the visitor walks, and that the past deepens as the visitor walks, but the horizon forward is never very, very, very far. And we narrate through first person, uh, well, I say through the first person, I mean that metaphorically, but through quotations from primary sources in the period to create a multi-voiced narration. And in that sense, you could say that this is the dramatic script in this scenographic space. And it's a very powerful way to work. And the, I would say that um, the, 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 the exhibition is also performative in the sense that it uh, it does more than say or show, but it actually um, does something beyond that. And that would be the case of the uh, uh, wooden synagogue that inspired the painted ceiling and roof, uh, whose documentation you'll see tomorrow. It's an incredible project. But just very briefly, to whet your appetite and encourage you to come tomorrow, uh, basically, uh, during the 17th and 18th centuries, very, very beautiful, very complicated wooden synagogues were created across the length and breadth of the Commonwealth, which means Ukraine, Lithuania, uh, Belarus, Poland, and um, all of them were destroyed during World War II. The Germans burnt all of them down, none of them remain. And so what we did was to take the very best documented one, the one that stands in Gwozdziec, which is today in Ukraine, and using this documentation, what we did was to put together a team, and the motto uh, with Hans House Studio, the studio we worked with was, that you can never recover the original object in the sense of the original material, but you can recover the knowledge of how to build it by building it using traditional tools, materials, and techniques. And that's what we did. And in that sense, it was the doing that is important. And in order to, in order to, uh, dis in order to recover the knowledge, you had to actually build it, and the outcome was a new kind of object. And that is the big message. And so we actually started with 200 raw logs with the bark still on, and with timber framers who brought their own historical tools, their adzes, pit saws, lathes. It's like Lord of the Rings. They brought them in, they, you know, they brought them in ski bags and, and, and in golf bags on the plane. I don't know how they did it. And they basically mentored and taught volunteers who had never picked up a hammer, let alone a pit saw. Um, and they, uh, we assembled in three workshops in, in one summer in 2011 in, in a Skansen, an open-air architecture museum in the south of Poland. We, we created the timber framing. It's put together with wooden pegs. And at the end of the summer, we pulled out the pegs, numbered the parts, stored them, and then eventually brought them to the museum and re reassembled this structure. And then we, um, we actually raised it. And, and suspended it from cables so that it floats. And it's really an incredible uh, experience. And then we did the same thing with this painted ceiling. We divided it into sections. And we did workshops also using traditional tools, materials, and techniques. And we did so in synagogues across the length and breadth of Poland that are still standing, masonry synagogues, and engaged local communities in the creating of these elements. And then, of course, this is the the, the finished result, which is just absolutely spectacular. The bima was created the same way. Um, it's 100% scale. The, the ceiling and the roof are 85% scale. Uh, you experience it in the museum only uh, from the inside, 
but in fact there's an opening in the ceiling and the roof comes up into the main floor and is juxtaposed with this very, very modern building. And it's just um, a very, very special experience. But my favorite are the children. So we have uh, basically we have wonderful programs, pardon me, educational programs. We give the kids a cushion with two straps. They wear, the, wear it like a backpack, and they walk around the museum like little turtles, you know, with their house on the back. But when they come here, we encourage them to take off the cushion, lie down, and just gaze up. And I have a feeling for some of these kids, this will be the most memorable museum experience of their childhood, that they'll come back as adults and they'll say, listen, I just want 15 minutes. I only want to go. Uh, you know, I don't have a cushion. I'm not going to lie on the floor, but that's what I want to do. So um, in any event, the, the, uh, the idea of this Museum of History is, for example, to take inspiration from this 1772 image of Russia, Prussia, and Austria tearing up the map of the Commonwealth and each taking a piece. And then we express this in scenographic terms in the exhibition. This is one of the more theatrical areas. So I think what I'll probably do is leave it there. I have lots of other interesting examples of ways in which we really um, used a, a much more both performance and performative approach, very much informed, I think, by, by the many, many years that I was at the Department of Performance Studies at NYU. So I think I'll leave it there, and uh, we'll open up to, we'll turn on the lights, we'll open it up to questions, comments, whatever you would like. Thank you. So, that was pretty fast, <laughs> but I'm assuming that we had a lot of pictures, so it's okay. So anybody been to Poland? Not, you've been to Poland, okay. Uh, in the last three years? Yes, yes. so you, we, you were at the museum? So this is of course an invitation to come to Poland mm -hmm. and to come to Poland Museum. Um, and there's an announcement here about the film, when? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, where? Tomorrow, at what time? Tomorrow? Beta student at 2.15. It's a documentary about the entire project of reconstructing the... It's a brilliant, it's an absolutely brilliant film. Very, very, very moving. I mean, it, you know, it's another one of, it, it sounds like, oh, making a wooden synagogue sounds boring. No. It's really fabulous. And it's won all kinds of awards at film festivals. It's really, really fabulous, so I, uh, I encourage you to come. Oh, I need a Oh, you're fair. What you fair? Okay, I want a copy from my archive. Yeah. Is it possible to come closer and talk to them? I'm going to come. Now, listen, I've been talking to them for the last hour. They've got to talk to me now. Now that's your turn. Come on, guys, don't be shy. This is Israel. You're not shy. Okay. because I found something really interesting where you've got this string of public engagement through your work, but um, you're dealing with very different relationships to place, so displaced people or people in the place in Poland, and also in the objects of the research, from a book and a film, which are these kind of highly plausible objects, to the museum, which is very much in a specific place, working with specific people in that place. And I wondered if you could comment a bit on, um, as a scholar, kind of these two modes of working, kind of displaced and in place? That, that's, it's a great question. Um, let's see. Um, you know, I would say that displacement is the governing term. Because even, that is, you know, I, I, I be, what happened was after I worked on the Image Before My Eyes project and I realized I had all these black and white images, this huge image bank, I thought to myself, you know what, I've got to go to Poland. So it was 1981 and I, I went to Poland. I begged my father to come with me and he said, no way. Um, he was very, very, very negative. He, he, he completely turned around, but he was quite negative. And I knew that I wouldn't be going back to his Poland. I didn't know it was martial law, it was under communism. It was, it was, if you will, a different place. It was a different time, but it was also a different place. It was still connected to all the images and the stories and everything that I knew. It was still connected to what he remembered, but it was so out of time that it was, in a sense, also out of place and all the intervening events. And then um, 
I would say that, in a sense, um, you know, something very interesting happened, and that is when he finally agreed to come with me to Poland, uh, the, the way things developed was that somebody in his town took an interest in him when we were visiting at one point, and this person followed the development of his book, the development of his paintings, and in the mid-2000s convinced the county chief to, that, that we had to have an exhibition of my father's work in the town, in the town. So we went, we were there during the Krakow Festival, and we went uh, to the town and we said, you know what, we can't give you the paintings, you only have a county seat, it's not a proper gallery, but my father will give a talk. I'll show the slides, he'll tell his stories in Polish, and they said, fine, but then afterwards there was a reception and the, and the county chief said, no, no, we want the exhibition. So we then, I said, okay, I'll send you digital files. You, you do geological survey, you've got a big printer. You'll be able to print these images and then you can keep them and you can use them. So sure enough, they did, they made an exhibition. We went, they had a ribbon cutting, they had a whole ceremony. And then I realized what was going on. And what was going on is that the war had so displaced people from their homes and their places that in a town that was now 7,000 people, only 10 families had pre-war roots in this town. And so there was almost nobody who remembered anything. And so my father's memories and the images, and I remember uh, one of the most moving moments was when I saw that like, the church had announced the event and there were posters. And, and I, I remember seeing, they put, they put the marketplace on the poster and the poster was, uh, uh, nailed to a tree in the marketplace and I saw a woman with a young child and I saw her pointing to the image of the marketplace on the poster and pointing to the marketplace and having the, this kid make the connection between what it had been before the war and what it looked like now because the marketplace now essentially is a park. It looks like a park. So it's a completely different, uh, it's a completely different situation. The, the, um, the idea that in a sense, you had to bring the place back to the place. I think that, that was the moment where, in a sense, he brought the place back to the place. And for those living there, it was the most extraordinary gift. They, they so treasured it. So just to give you a, a sense, because um, I would say this really goes to the mission and the way I think our museum works, which I call constructive engagement. So after the exhibition, and we had the exhibition, we went back, we went back home, and uh, I got an email from the art teacher in the high school. And she said that she did a competition where the high school art students should go around the town and make a drawing or a photograph of the places, the way they look now, compared to what my father painted and remembered. And that there would be an announcement of the competition um, on October 22nd, something like that. And I didn't think anything of it. And on October 23rd, I get another email. Now, it turns out October 22nd is actually 1942. Well, I'll tell you that in a moment. So what does the email say? It says that on October 22nd, the, the, the town of Apatov held a special service in the church, which is 1,000 years old, and that it was the first time ever that the town commemorated the deportation of all the Jews of a part of to Treblinka, the first time. Because in two days, I think October 21st, 22nd, 1942, three weeks after I was born, all the Jews in my father's town were deported to Treblinka, 500 of them to forced labor in Sandomierz. This had never been a date on the calendar of this town. And at this ceremony, they lit blue and white candles, they had high school students read testimony from witnesses to the deportation, they had the results of the competition, and I, that was for me exceptionally, exceptionally, exceptionally moving. So um, I would say that there is something about um, a place that has been in a sense evacuated of memory. There's a way in which um, the, the way, the, the, a way in which my father in a sense um, embedded a kind of memory of the place on the place which was without memory, really. And they knew that, and they felt, um, they really, I, I don't know what they, what they or their parents remembered about the places from which they came, but the idea of living in a place <laughs> where only 10 families out of 7,000 people have any, any pre-war uh, connections is, is really, well, it's a very, I think, East European, 
post-war, post-Holocaust story. So, um, but it's, it's a question I have to think a lot more about because I, I think there's a lot in your question, a lot more than I, than I, I have to reflect on it, really. Other, yeah. Thank you, first of all, it's very fascinating. I'm interested in myself in collective memory, but I find difficulty in making it accessible and approachable for audience, mainly because of the reason that we've heard this story before. And you said that you went through 5,000 black and white, 50,000? Uh, 15. 15,000. And you chose in... 500, five. more or less. How? I mean, like... Oh, how? You choose history, what do you take into consideration for the choices? Okay, in this case, I would say that it, you know, it's, it's, uh, when you ask me that question, if you were to ask me that question about the museum and how we made the choices for the exhibition of the museum, it would actually be easier for me to answer. And the reason is because uh, first of all, it's closer in time, because yeah, it, basically it's now, but also because it, um, the choices involved much more intervention into the material. Because with the photographs, you choose the photographs, then you, you cluster them, you sequence them, you juxtapose them. I think, I think one of the, or here were some of the principles. One, uh, what we wanted to do was to show the range and the scope of Jewish life. And we thought that was important because the image of East European Jews and Polish Jews was the image that they were all poor, pious, and persecuted. And who was perspective? Okay, I would say this, popular culture. And many historians. The older historians, that is historians from the 19th century and the early 20th century, basically, I think, in some ways, they wrote histories in which the Western European Jews were emancipated, enlightened, refined, European, and the East European Jews were backwards, pious, lived in a backward society, um, were unenlightened, were religious and uh, poor, and it was, I think, part of a, almost like you might say, a, um, well, it was a kind of a project uh, towards the, uh, I would say, emancipation, not just emancipation in the legal sense, but uh, part of a project of uh, making, or, or if you will, uh, thinking about themselves as part of European society and not as something separate and exotic. So there was the, the, the Ostjuden, was a kind of construction of, the, uh, of West European Jews. And you can see it in literature, art, film, uh, way histories were written, travelogues. Uh, and so that was something we wanted to work against. And the, there's an historian, Salo Baron, from the last generation of historians that believed you could write a complete history of, of the Jews. He got to, fit, to volume 15, somewhere in the mid-18th century and died. So I don't know how much longer it would have taken him to, you know, to come up to the present. And it's a good thing he didn't live long enough to have to write the, the volume on the Holocaust, uh, because God knows how he would have to revise the, the, the previous uh, 15 volumes. But in any event, he made it a kind of, um, um, I would say, his mission to work against a, what he called a lachrymose history, a history of tears, a sad history of the Jews, a history of the Jews generally, but of East European Jews in particular, as a history of piety, poverty, and persecution. So it's coming from hi historiography, it's coming from the arts, it's coming from, from uh, popular culture like Fiddler on the Roof. So it's coming from a variety of sources, and it, at least in the United States, or in North America, it's really strong. Also in Europe, very, very, very strong. And so we knew that we had to work against that. And one of the ways we could do it was by, um, in, in a sense, um, doing two things. One, um, dealing with the historical nature of the photography itself. And two, making sure that we were exposing a full range and variety of Jewish life, that all the different ways of being Jewish, being Polish, being Polish-Jewish, Jewish-Polish, whatever it might be, and all the strata of society, and, but setting it in time so that you had a sense of the earliest material, which would be 19th century coming forward. But by introducing the book with a history of photography, we wanted our visitors to understand that photographs are not windows 
on the world that they are artifacts, they are cultural objects. And so that was also a factor because we didn't want to simply use them as a kind of um, a clear window or a, a kind of mirror. They're neither a window nor a mirror. They are artifacts and they, they, they need to be seen for what they are as uh, photographs as a medium and that medium changes also. And we also wanted to show how this medium is, is in a sense remediated in postcards, in the illustrated press, um, and, and, and ways in which it, the, the photographs are actually used. Um, so, uh, and we also had an opportunity because there's a lot of photo reportage that includes photographs that deal with historical events, with pogroms, with, um, so that it, it, we had an opportunity to, to really, um, I, I would say, work very creatively with this corpus um, and um, to, how can I say, to provide a kind of, I would say, um, on the one hand, a kind of photographic portrait, and you know people dress up for their portraits, so we had to be careful that it didn't mislead, but also a kind of visual history uh, without, uh, uh, without forgetting that photographs are photographs and not windows and mirrors. So that, th those would be some of the ways in which we were thinking about the material. Yeah. Without memory, um, the, the Polish workers in the museum, one were involved in making the exhibition. Um, you who came to the land from the from the America, um, what is the interconnections that emerge in the in the place between uh, the different? personal memories of those who do not have this uh, memory and the memory of them that the museum actually exposes or tells? Well, you know, it's, it, it's um, I would say this. The first thing is that we try very hard, and I think um, there are a lot of museums that don't do this, but we try very hard, in a sense, to separate memory and history. Um, now, of course, that is, um, you can't do it, but, but basically, fundamentally, our thought was that the monument is a site of memory, pure site of memory, uh, in the sense that we, go, we it, because it's such a ceremonial object, that we go to the monument to honor those who died by remembering how they died. And all the Israeli groups that come, they, they go to the monument, and they light these enormous oil lamps, and they... They, they have ceremonies there, whether it's from the army, or it's officers, or it's youth groups. But it is a very, very iconic and very important uh, place. And it's treated, of course, guides usually narrate and they, they, they tell about the Warsaw Ghetto uh, uprising, but it's done in a way that's rather more memorial than historical. Even though the information is historical, it functions um, in a, um, as, as, it functions in a commemorative way. Our intention and our feeling is that the museum completes the memorial complex. Now, um, on the what, so when I say that, I say that um, that we go to the museum to remember, to honor their memory by remembering how they lived for a thousand years. But that doesn't. But but having said that, I don't think of the museum itself and of the uh, exhibition itself as a site of memory. And this is really important. I think of it. I think of the, of the museum as an institution of public history, not as a memorial, not as commemorative, and within the exhibition itself, and actually within the museum itself, there is no memorial or commemorative element. And in a sense, it's an attempt, um, maybe a failed attempt, to protect history from memory. I mean, I know that's controversial, and this is something we should that we should discuss which is to say that, um, of course, people bring with them, uh, if you will, primary memories, that is to say that they were themselves in the events themselves, or secondary memory, inherited memory, post-memory, they, they bring much with them, for sure. But um, it's very, very, because 
um, so much of this history is focused on the Holocaust, and so much of the focus on the Holocaust is, in fact, about memory and commemoration, we really wanted to push back from that. We really wanted to somehow rather distance the narrative from that. And as a result, one of the things that we do throughout the exhibition is to keep the narrative in the moment of the telling. That is to say, in the moment of the story. So when you're in the medieval gallery, there's no fast forward and looking back. When you're in the Holocaust gallery, there is no Holocaust, there's no survivor testimony on video. There's nothing from the Shoah archive. For that, you go to our resource center, and then you can sit and you can explore all the Holocaust testimony that you would like. The idea of keeping, the, the, like there are two narrative principles, which I mean, I think of them as really dramaturgical, and that is one narrative principle is to narrate, quote, in the first person. I mean that metaphorically, meaning in primary sources from the period itself and in many voices, and in that way it looks like a play script. But the second is to narrate in the historical present, meaning in the moment of the story itself, not, um, it, so in other words, in the present tense, so to speak. And, and why is that so important? It's so important because the, uh, what we want our visitors to do is to bracket what they know about what came later, and we want them to not, in other words, not to foreshadow and like the Holocaust is coming, the Holocaust is coming, and we want them not to backshadow and see this history through the lens of the Holocaust. Now that takes inc incredible discipline. It, it's, it, it, it's the pull, the pull, the teleological pull towards the Holocaust and the expectation that the narrative will be a narrative that basically shows how you get, get from hate to genocide. This is, this is the Holocaust narrative. This is what you get in Holocaust museums. And we wanted to do everything in our power to, to pull back against that. So as a result, memory is our enemy, in, in a way. I mean, that's very, uh, how can I say, it's very, um, um, it's an extreme, it's an extreme statement. Ob obviously, memory is also an ally, and way in memory, the way in which memory does work in the exhibition is also very interesting. But I would say that, um, so, so what does it mean for the visitors? Um, I love when um, a Polish visitor leaves the museum and says, you know, this is a museum of Polish history. Mm -hmm. And then I think to myself, that's brilliant, because this is somebody who is recognizing a museum that is not a museum of the history of the Polish nation and not a museum of the history of Polish state as a museum of Polish history. That, that a museum of one of Poland's many minorities could, and, and incidentally, so far it's the only thousand year history of Poland, which apparently bothered enough people that in around 2007 there was an announcement that they're going to make a museum of Polish history, because if they don't, we'll be the only one. So, um, so but, but, but the idea that a Polish visitor would recognize it as such and appreciate it as such, would take it on as such, that is for us an enormous, enormous, enormous triumph. For Jewish visitors, um, I would say that, well, it depends. For some of them uh, who have really come to Poland, in particular to commemorate the Holocaust, but who come to us and we try to get them to come to us first, sometimes right from the plane, in which case they're so jet lagged they can hardly focus, but be that as it may, for them, in fact, this thousand year history deepens the sense of loss. For them, they have the sense that not only were 3, 000, 3 million Polish Jews murdered, another th you know, ballpark figures, another three million European Jews, but also the world that they created was lost and so was the memory of that world. So for them, it is a Holocaust museum, but we try very hard that it should not be a Holocaust museum, but that's, they bring with them those uh, feelings, those, uh, those commitments, and a commitment to memory and memorialization. So for them, it's a different museum. Um, and I'm trying to think other, um, and then we've had visitors for whom, Jewish visitors, for whom the whole thing's a revelation, because in their upbringing, even if they went to Jewish schools, you know, they had Bible, Holocaust in Israel, that's it. And there's nothing in between. Probably in Israel it's similar. Um, and so this is a kind of revelation. So there's, I would say that uh, mem the way that memory works has very much to do with the visitors um, and with our efforts to restrain and to contain the way that memory could, um, I would say, diminish the fullness of the experience that we want our visitors to have. That's how I would answer. Can I have a question? Yep. Yep. Uh, but don't you explain to your visitors that um, what your purpose is? I mean, that you don't want to memorize uh, uh, anything, that, uh, or you just uh, let your visitors feel free to feel whatever they want? Because you just said that if 
I'm Jewish and I go there, I have different feelings from all these Christians. Okay, so you know it's interesting because um, this approach uh, is the opposite of what the current right-wing government would like to see. They would like to see, they have a certain idea, of, they, they have what they call historical policy, which can also be translated from Polish as the politics of history. And they have a very definite idea what the narrative should be. So I like to say that we don't have a master narrative on purpose. So Moshe Rossman, one of my favorite historians from Bar, Bar Ilan, he says, okay, you don't have a master narrative, but you do have what he called meta-historical principles. Now, we don't tell our visitors this. We don't say to them, dear visitor, before you go into this exhibition, remember, these are our meta-historical principles. <laughs> so, but I'll give you examples of what they are. So one of them is, everybody always asks, what's the most important period in the history of Polish Jews? And they already know when they ask. It's almost like a test. Do I know what's the most important period? So for most of them, it's the Holocaust, clearly. Then there's some for whom it's the post-war years because it's the period through which they lived in Poland. Some maybe the interwar years. For me, probably it would be the interwar years because it's my parents' period. Nobody, nobody says the medieval period. And the medieval period is more than 500 years. It's more than half the millennium. Nobody. And yet people love that gallery. They, they, they think it's one of the most interesting because they know nothing about it. So, I would, so, that's, so, so, so what's my answer? The single most important period in the history of Polish Jews is 1,000 years. All of it. That's the message. The message is that it's a thousand year story, a thousand years of continuous Jewish presence in this place. It's not Spain, it's not England, it's not Vienna, it's not Germany, it's not France, it's not parts of Italy. It's 1,000 years of continuous Jewish presence. So that's the, that, so that's the first meta-historical principle. Second, they all look like this. When I would present the museum in the United States, they, the, uh, my Jewish audiences would be totally, not, not worse than skeptical, cynical. They'd say, why are you making this museum in Poland? Why are you making it in Warsaw? Like, where should it be? They said, Tel Aviv. <laughs> it should be Tel Aviv, it should be New York. You know, take the museum to the Jews. I said, no, bring the Jews to the museum. Tell the story where the story happened. That's what you should do. So, of course, they said, well, there are no Jews there and there are Jews here, et cetera. But can you imagine this museum in Tel Aviv? No. No, no, no. there's no way. It's a, exactly. And it's in, I think it's important maybe that you deserve this idea for all this. Our Absolutely. Team. A site specific means you can harness the emotional power of the site. And that's the key. And even if it's a site of absence, listen, you go to Gettysburg, to the, the Battle of Gettysburg, there's nothing there. It's a big open field. And people get all teary and emotional at a big open field. Bec but, but that's where it happened. That's where it happened. So, so, it had to, so we said, no, it has to be in this place, absolutely, and especially on the site of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is a very, very powerful place. Plus, it was a huge plaza and a huge park, and okay. So I would present it to them in America, and, and they would say, uh, you know what, this, th forget this museum. We're not interested in supporting it. We're not interested in it. I say, why not? They said, because the Polish government, it's, they, all they want is tourist dollars, and they want to whitewash their history. And I thought, oh my God, that is so unbelievably cynical. Then I would present it in Poland, and they would say, no way. This is going to be a museum of the history of anti-Semitism. So between the Jews who are worried that it would whitewash the history and the Poles that were worried it would be nothing but anti-Semitism, and of course, it's absolutely neither. So what we present, and this is the meta-historical principle, is something we call a spectrum of relations a spectrum of relations. If you don't think in terms of a spectrum, you cannot explain how this place became home to the largest Jewish community in the world. Half the Jews in the world in the middle of the 18th century were living in the territory of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, 750,000 Jews. It doesn't happen in a place that's one unmitigated story of violence and anti-Semitism. It just doesn't happen. So we say spectrum. It means, uh, it means um, uh, coexistence, and conflict, cooperation and competition, separation and integration. There are times when one is much higher, the other one is much higher. It depends. It, it really depends on the period. But the idea of a spectrum of relations is much more interesting and gives us a lot more insight. So that would be a second principle. Third principle was that Jews are not only in Poland, but they are also of Poland, meaning that 
the history of Poland is not complete without a history of Polish Jews, and that what we want to present is what we call an integral history, not like a separate Polish history, a separate Jewish history, or a Polish context to put Jews into the picture. So th there are others, but th these would be the, the meta-historical principles. Now, the approach is an open narrative, and the approach is multi-voiced. And I have to tell you that this is not normal in Poland and in, in, in basically in Eastern Europe because they have textbooks, they have an idea what the story should be, they have you know the Museum of the Warsaw Uprising. Uh, when you leave, you don't know who won. The, the kids come out thinking that the Poles won, but in fact they were completely defeated. But so you, you get the idea. But here, this idea of an open narrative, um, I had the Facing History, which is a very interesting group in the U.S. that, that um, encourages dialogue around difficult historical topics. And they came, and they were very interested in our approach. So I uh, told them how we presented the Celtic pogrom from July 4th, 1946, which is a devastating event, absolutely devastating. And we present the pogrom, and there's a whole lot of things we do, and then we present four interpretations of the pogrom from the period. Nothing from after, nothing from after two, 1989, only from the 40s, from the moment of the period. We save Jan Gross and all those people for later. So, because we consider that part of the post-war story. So, what did the Polish underground say? The anti-communist underground, they blamed the communists. What did the communists say? They blamed the anti-communist underground. What did the Bishop of Kelsa say? He blamed the Jews, believe it or not. What did the sociologist from Warsaw University say? He blamed Polish society, or he at least took Polish society to task that how could in this society such a thing happen? It didn't mean that everybody in the society made the pogrom. So one of the ladies from the group, she says, you give them four interpretations from the period? You don't tell them which is the right interpretation? She said, you mean that you would take the risk, you would take the chance that they'll make up their own errant narratives, their own mistaken narratives? I said, you bet. That's a chance I would take. So then I had an historian that was on a committee, they were very worried about the post-war years, that was reviewing everything. And she said, but how, how, how can you be sure they're going to see the most important things? She said, you should put a red dot on the most important things. You know, so it's, it's just not, I would say this, that we have a much more um, confidence and trust in our visitors. We respect our visitors. We don't start out with the the assumption that a bunch of an Polish anti-Semites are coming to our museum and we're going to fix them. That's not our approach. It's not our starting point. In fact, they're not the ones that come to the museum. The ones that come to the museum are already interested and open. So it's, it's um, and I would say the last principle is that our goal is to create a zone of trust. We want them to trust us and we want to trust them. And if we can create the zone of trust, maybe we can have a dialogue and a debate that isn't polarizing as it is in the public in the public sphere. That whenever a young gross book comes out, whenever another you know Yedvabna event is exposed, then there's like absolutely polarizing debates. So you know our goal is to is to create as an institution of public history to create this zone of trust. So that's basically what we do. Any other, how are how we doing? Uh, but the interesting thing is it's always five to two. <laughs> Stops. Time stops. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, we're done? No, thank you very much. Thank you very much.